Hi, my name is Taylor Duncan and I am an undergrad at UCSC. This will be my last quarter at UCSC and I am currently applying to grad schools for the fall of 2021. I'm majoring in earth science with a concentration in planetary science and I've had the pleasure to study outgassing experiments on carbonaceous chondrites to better understand how icy bodies like Titan obtain their secondary atmosphere. Now, before I continue with this presentation, I'm just gonna minimize my video so um, I'm not in the way of any of the slides. So let me do that. All right, here's a brief overview of what I will be going over today. The motivation for our research is to understand where Titan's atmosphere comes from and potentially reveal the mystery behind why there is still methane present in Titan's atmosphere. I will also be going over what instruments we use, heating schemes, our results, and future experiments later on in the presentation. So Titan is the only known moon in the solar system with a substantial atmosphere of nitrogen and methane. However, its origin and evolution are not well understood. Titan's present amount of atmospheric methane was predicted to be destroyed photochemically on very short timescales compared to the age of the solar system, suggesting a resupply mechanism is necessary. Recent work published by Neary et al.'s 2019 paper proposed Titan's observably reduced moment of inertia could be due to a low density material near the core and this layer could potentially be composed of primordial organics. If this theory holds true, volatiles like methane could be outgassing from Titan's interior to form its atmosphere. Evidence of Titan's atmosphere being outgassed from its interior was also constrained by Huygens gas chromatograph and mass spectrometer when it discovered radiogenic argon being outgassed from the moon's interior. This leads us to investigating the thermal outgassing of primordial organics using carbonaceous chondrites. So why we are specifically experimenting with carbonaceous chondrites is because the insoluble organic material or IOMs for short um, in CM chondrites is like we said previously is analogous to the potential primordial material in Titan's uh, interior. If this theory holds, this could resupply half of the necessary methane in Titan's present atmosphere. We conducted um, our outgassing experiments with the Murchison meteorite. We chose Murchison in particular because it has a substantial amount of IOMs. Uh, it is also a fall meteorite, which gives more pristine samples compared to a fine meteorite. Previous studies, such as uh, Okamara et al.'s, studied the outgassing of the IOMs, whereas our studies focused on outgassing of the bulk meteorite. So we used two sample sizes from Murchison, one being our small grain sample size, which was less than 20 micrometers, and the other being our normal grain sample size, which was between 20 to 100 micrometers. We placed these samples in alumina combustion boats, then placed them in the furnace, which is connected to our turbo molecular pump. This brings the entire system to a base pressure of 10 to the negative five torr at room temperature. The residual gas analyzer that you can see on the right of the image continuously measures the partial pressures of the 10 species and the thermocouple on the left side of the image um, is placed into the tube to measure the temperature as a function of time. Now, although we conduct each heating experiment under high vacuum conditions, slight contamination may still be possible. Therefore, before we place our samples in, we did some background measurements to properly calibrate the background signal. So we experimented with two different heating schemes one steady heating scheme where we gradually heated our samples, um, small and normal size, up to 1,000 to 1,200 degrees Celsius. Um, for the um, step heating scheme, we used normal size exclusively samples and gradually heated them up to 400, 600, 
800 and 1000 degrees Celsius and held them at their respective temperatures for five hours. We also held at 200 degrees Celsius for every trial for 12 hours so that we could get rid of any H2O signals that may have been on our, sample, uh, on our samples. So first we're going to show our steady heating scheme plots. Like I said previously, this is just the background data so that we can get rid of any potential contamination from our results. Um, now these are the raw data plots for both the small and normal grain samples. They're very similar to each other, so so far there hasn't been any drastic differences, but we want to make sure these plots can be as accurate as possible. That's why we need to account for subtracting the background data from our raw data and also including any ion fragmentation or atmospheric absorption. So to successfully do this, there are some equations we need to use. To account for the background subtraction is quite simple. We took the sum of the partial pressures from the background data and subtracted that from the sum of the partial pressures from our continuous heating data. This ultimately determines the background subtracted partial pressures. To correct for the ion fragmentation and atmospheric absorption, a little more math is required. I've listed a few examples of the calculations needed. To correct for ion fragments for a certain species, we subtract its partial pressure from the partial pressures of other species that contribute to its mass signal, then multiply that by the percentage of each other species contribution. In addition to correct for the possibility of terrestrial atmospheric adsorption onto the samples, we assume that the signal at 40 AMU is due entirely to atmospheric argon adsorbed onto the sample. One key correction that I will be going over through my results is the argon correction. I have boxed in red for the partial pressure of methane. I have made two versions of my plots for both the steady and step heating schemes. One using the more stringent correction by subtracting the 4.96 times the partial pressure of argon and one neglecting this correction. Now that we've corrected for ion fragmentation, the atmospheric adsorption um, and the atmospheric adsorption, excuse me, uh, the signal due to nitrogen can be taken out of the plot um, because it's negligibly small. It's less than 10 to the negative 10 torr. Uh, you can see for both the small and normal sample, there's no signal for methane. However, CO2 levels are relatively the same for both the small and normal grain, but they differ, they differ in their CO, H2S, and H2O signals. Now, using the less stringent method, we can see that there is um, signals for methane, uh, which is the only difference uh, from the previous plots. We can see methane seems to be more prevalent in the small grain sample and appears right after the 600 degrees Celsius and then reappears again around 800 degrees Celsius to 1,200 degrees Celsius. For the normal grain, it only appears around um, a little bit at 200, a little at 600, and just barely any at 1,200 degrees Celsius. Now we'll be moving on to our second heating scheme, which is the step heating scheme. Uh, for the stringent step heating scheme, we can see there's no methane whatsoever for our different temperatures. For the 600 degrees Celsius plot, almost all the species disappear after being held for two and a half hours. The signals for H2O, CO, and CO2 are consistent for all the plots, excluding the 600 degrees Celsius. For the less stringent plots, we can see that methane doesn't appear until we reach the 800 and 1000 degrees Celsius plots. For the 800, it's near the beginning of the hold, whereas for the 1000 degrees Celsius plots, uh, it shows methane at the beginning and at the end of the five hours. The H2O, CO, and CO2 signals are consistent in this plot, just like the previous plots. Nothing has changed there. So we can see from the steady heating scheme that grain size showed different signals for our species. This may mean that there's a significant correlation between grain size and abundances of particular outgas species. For the step heating scheme, 
we use normal sample sizes and judging from our results from the steady heating, we may get different results if we use a small grain sample size opposed to normal. The lack of methane in our plots could also be explained by our, um, con like our conservative atmospheric corrections. Removing the argon correction for the partial pressures of methane gave us, uh, gave us peaks of methane at higher temperatures. However, adding back in the argon correction, there was no signal for methane throughout all of our plots. This makes us question what corrections are considered to be an overcorrection. For both the steady heating and step heating scheme, the most abundant outgas species proved to be H2O, CO2, and CO. We intend to conduct new experiments involving the sample size change from normal to small for our step heating scheme and continue using the Murchison meteorite. Moder monitoring 15 AMU signal may also be in our best interest for these new experiments because CH3, which is, has a mass of 15 AMU, is the main fragment of methane and a few other species fragments to 15 AMU. So the 15 AMU signal could be a better indicator of methane instead of 16 AMU. It is also our goal to experience, um, experiment with other carbonaceous chondrites so we can compare our findings. Ultimately, by accounting for these overcorrections, testing different sample sizes, uh, heating schemes, and improving our correction schemes for um, ion fragmentation, we may get plots with more methane that are analogous to what we see in Titan's atmosphere today. This would in turn give us even more concrete evidence that our theory of insoluble organic material um, from carbonaceous chondrites are outgassing from Titan's interior. Um, so I just wanna say thank you for listening to my talk. Um, I've listed my contact information on the right-hand side. And if you had any questions for me, I'd be more than happy to answer them. And um, I will be seeing everyone in December. Uh, so yeah, thanks again.